When I was 13 years old, I saw a ghost. I was in good company in broad daylight. I was in the Episcopal Church that I grew up in. I was there for a Saturday meeting with a whole bunch of other teenagers. And it was a cruciform church. We were up at the, at the front in the sanctuary looking back towards the nave. And there are big, beautiful stained glass windows along the side. And right there in the middle of the day, through one of the windows came a very distinct flow of mist. In a, in a very purposeful manner, came in up through the open window and then came down and bounced into one of the transept sets of pews where it sat for a moment, making sort of a, a blob of mist for a minute. And then it turned direction, rose up out of that set of pews, rose high in the air, and settled back down into the center of set of pews. And when it happened, I thought to myself, first of all, Oh my God. Secondly, did I just, I'm standing with a whole bunch of people. Did anybody else just see that or was it just me? And the girl that was standing next to me grabbed me by the arm and said, did you just see what I saw? So we never got an explanation for what it was. It was a really interesting moment for me because it was my first and only experience with something truly otherworldly and that I couldn't explain. But it didn't feel scary in any way. It felt purposeful and different and interesting, but not threatening in any way. Over time, I not only meandered away from organized religion, I found myself on a path to sort of an aggressive form of skepticism. But at the same time, I kept this really intense interest in knowing what it could have been that I saw, what it was that maybe I experienced, and then reading the stories of other people and things that they've experienced and wondering what it is that could possibly be behind their experiences. And so I immersed myself in literature, the paranormal, the antics of spoonbenders, how could they possibly do it? Uh, and mind readers and read ghost stories by the books full. And I found out that maybe it runs in the family because at some point my great great grandfather tried to talk to the dead. This is him, Alexander Black, looking kind of stern and authorial late in life. Uh, this is maybe a better idea of him as a younger man, but I, this is the one I was looking for. This is. <laughs> He was a, a writer, a newspaper man, and an author at the end of the Victorian period. Um, he was not an enthusiastic fan of spiritualism. In fact, by all appearances, he was a pretty rational guy. Um, but he lived in New York City right at the time that the spiritualist movement really picked up steam. And the heyday of the great Victorian uh, the great spiritualist movement came in the late Victorian period into the early 20th century. And it was a time at which it seemed like the veil between life and death not only was torn, and not only did the dead begin to manifest and communicate, at times they just wouldn't shut up. It was an era with a creative abundance of methods for communicating with the dead, from direct channeling spirits, speaking through mediums. <laughs> Good catch. Automatic writing, planchettes and talking boards, which most of you are familiar with as a Ouija board. The Fox sisters <laughs> uh, interpreted ghostly wrappings to, to understand the, uh, the, other the other world. William Mumler introduced the world to spirit photography. And Sir Arthur Conan Doyle basically declared that absolutely everything was evidence of the supernatural. One of the most popular methods to talk to the dead were spirit slates. Um, there's some variation on the theme, but here's how it works, basically. And this is sort of the story I got coming down for family lore that uh, Alexander Black did. He went to a medium that had been recommended to him, and the medium asked him before he came to the session to write down the names of some people that had died that he was interested in communicating with, to put them on little pieces of paper and to bring them with him when he showed up. And so he did this, and he came to the medium, and they sat, and he, he sat down, and she said, take all of those names and all of those pieces of paper and wad them up into tiny little balls and then push them across the table. And he did that and pushed them across the table and she went through the pile and she said, yes, yes, no, yes, no, yes. And then she took the pile of names with yes and she put them between two school board slates, two chalk slates, um, along with some pieces of chalk, wrapped it in a cloth and they both laid their hands on the slates. And as they did, she summoned the spirits and there was a sound of scratching, scratching chalk in between the layers. And when she opened them, this is what they looked like. 
These are his actual spirit slates. Amazingly, they still exist. They're in the family collection back east. And they're full of personal notes. Uh, there's one from his long dead mother, Sarah, who died in the 1850s, and another from his uncle, Peter. There's at least one note in which he is referred to by a childhood nickname. I think we can all agree they're pretty fucking amazing. <laughs> And they were really, really, really powerful. They were one of the most, they, one of the most common spirit communication tools in the spiritualist era. And they were a, a, just an absolute phenomenon for convincing people coming in the first time through the door that they could communicate with the dead and sort of get them in to believe in more spiritual practices. But <laughs> here's the thing. It should come as a surprise to no one here tonight that one by one these chatty spirits were shown to be clever manipulations by clever con men, and in most cases, clever con women. The Fox sisters famously popped the joints of their toes to make their spirit rapping sound. Mumler invented the double exposure. Planchettes are driven, if you would like to think of it innocently, by the audiometer effect or cynically by manipulative mediums. Tables were levitated, trumpets blared, and ectoplasm appeared through the tricks and techniques of sleight of hand and innovative inventions. Which brought the attention of a really interesting group of people. The mediums were pursued with great relish by medium busters who came with an unusual skill set, stage magicians. Harry Houdini and John Neville Maskeville, Maskeline, sorry, dedicated their careers to debunking fraudulent mediums by exposing the techniques they used by recreating them for the stage with an interesting footnote that as a result, they were accused <laughs> by true believers and possibly by like recently unemployed spiritualists of playing a double agent and debunkers, these debunkers were actually supernaturally gifted and working to hide the existence of magic from us all. Which is clearly, clearly <laughs> true. Yes. But you would think that maybe some other people would have a say in this, that maybe science would weigh in, but uh, Interestingly enough, although there were definitely scientists involved in the debunking efforts, historically, scientists, the people that you would sort of expect to be above such rid ridiculous scams, have always dabbled in a little bit of dark magic in alchemy, and they too have sought proof of life after death and material evidence for the soul. Sir Isaac Newton, as we've discussed here before, actually spent more time dedicated to his pursuit of alchemy and the Philosopher's Stone than he did to calculus by a lot. Um, Alfred Russell Wallace of the evolutionary theory was an enthusiastic spiritualist, and he didn't just dabble, but he also advocated for, for, spiritual, for supernatural phenomena. The Nobel Prize winner Pierre Curie was fond of a specific seance um, spiritualist named Giuseppe Palladino, about whom he wrote, there is here, in my opinion, a whole domain of entirely new facts and physical states in space of which we have no conception. She was busted shortly after his death. Uh, interestingly, this photograph here shows her conducting a seance in the home of another noted scientist and occult enthusiast, the astronomer Camille Flammarion. In 1920, Edison announced his plans to create a telephone that would allow you to communicate with the dead. He wrote, I've been thinking for some time of a machine or apparatus which could be operated by personalities which have been, who have passed on to another existence or sphere. Uh, strangely, reporters coming after him in the years following those statements were unable to get him to commit to a story about why that had not happened. In 1907, the physician Duncan McDougall calculated the exact weight of a human soul as 21 grams. He meticulously measured the difference in weight in a body at the moment of death to come to his conclusions. And perhaps most famously, Jack Parsons, genius rocket scientist, founder of the Jet Propulsion Laboratories, was also a high-ranking member of Alistair Crowley's Ordo Templi Lorientis and claimed that he could summon the devil. So, so much for rational thought. But Perhaps, just perhaps, this open-minded inquiry is not as crazy after all, because in two separate sets of tests, relatively recently, researchers have been able to conjure ghosts, or at least the feeling of a ghostly presence. In the first experiment, researchers created a robot that mimics your mo motions and then placed it behind research subjects. And when a test subject would reach forward, the robot would poke them ever so gently in the back. 
When the timing was synced up, this was totally fine. Everything's fine. You're just touching yourself in the back somehow with a robot hand. But when they adjusted the timing off by just the tiniest margin, it became upsetting. You began to feel like you were being touched by someone or something different. Science, absolutely. In the other related experiment, in what sounds like fun times in the lab, uh, researchers found that by inserting electrodes into a certain part of the brain, I'm just gonna quote from the Nature article, they said, they found that they could induce a patient to sense an illusory shadow person was lurking behind her and mimicking her movements. So, our brains are not to be trusted, as we've learned over and over and over again. But this thing, this thing, this idea that if we feel something, if we see something, if we experience something, how do we define what is or is not real? And so I've thought about this line between skepticism and open-minded inquiry as we got ready for this salon, and I wondered the idea, what if these mediums are con men? So what if it's all fake? What's the harm in believing like just a, just a little bit? And here's my thoughts. Magical thinking begets scalability and discourages critical thinking, and that's how you end up the mark. On the other hand, learning to sort fact from fantasy and to pierce the veil not of the afterlife, but being able to see the wires and the gears that are turning in the background, to recognize the pop toes and to see the cheesecloth and know when you're being manipulated, that has real practical value. So for me, knowing that a trick is just a trick, the idea that a medium isn't actually speaking to your loved ones, but it's cooked up an elaborate ruse to convince me of that, knowing that it's fake is beautiful. Falling for it, or allowing others that we care about to fall for it, is to take advantage of the credulous, to exploit their grief and their longing for loved dead ones for profit, and that's wrong. If science continues to keep unraveling the mysteries that make us, of what makes us see things and hear things and experience things, if they can tell me what happened that afternoon in the church where I experienced my ghostly visitor, I would feel that same sense of awe at understanding what was going on. I would marvel at the moment no less. To seek the truth and to unmask the dishonest is not the same thing as pretending that we know everything. It's to be part of a continuum out of the dark towards enlightenment, and there's no way to know what wonders we still have to behold. So I'd like to raise the first glass and I'd like to invoke this evening with the words of Shakespeare and Hamlet. There are more things on heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy, Horatio. Or paraphrase. Cheers. To open minds and critical thinking, let's start the night.